first year working with the Chicago Dogs when I was fresh out of college. I literally graduated in the middle of the season and was on the road doing 100 games, crisscrossing the Midwest with a bunch of guys who were in their 30s who had, you know, a lot of them were married with kids. Some of them had played in the majors. I just mentioned my coach had played in the majors and managed there. And I had to grow. That really was a, a huge developmental experience for me because I went to Gun the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of Beyond the Ball Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and I'm always excited to bring on very special guests. And, and this gentleman here is very, very, very special. Uh, we, we connected some time ago, and I'm just going to read a little bit about him just so you all can get a little bit familiarized uh, with, with Mr. Sam Brief. He's he's not only a sports broadcaster, but he's also an ultimate media professional. Right. He serves he serves as Chicago State University's assistant director for communications and broadcasting, where he is the play by play voice for the Cougars athletics. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring to the stage Mr. Sam Brief. Sam, how are we doing? What's up, Jonathan? Appreciate those kind words. It, it's great to be here. I, every time I talk to you, it fills me up. Right. It's fulfilling. So I'm I'm really honored to be on your show, Sam. That's really kind. That, 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 that's, that's that's really kind of you. That's really kind. But um, I mean but, it. Um, I mean it. Yeah, I man. Keep and my I, words I, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, from a from, from a true media person professional, I mean, I, I think I think it makes sense. You have to choose your words carefully, right? Oh, absolutely. Every word could be scrutinized, right? Whether it's live or on a podcast or written word it's really important you can't just throw away big old statements and expect people to not get it right you have to choose your words carefully mm, makes sense makes sense sam i'm gonna kick the i'm gonna kick the rock to you and i'm gonna give you a chance just to give a little snippet on yourself because i know i didn't hit all of what you do but go ahead take this time and you know if this is somebody's first introduction to you please go ahead and take a little bit of time and share a little bit about yourself yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. Appreciate you giving me that opportunity. I'm a Chicagoan. I've, I've been here my whole life in Chicago, born and raised in the North Suburbs, went to Northwestern University, and I've been working in the last few years here in the Chicago market. So I started with the Chicago Dogs baseball team, where I'm still a play-by-play -play broadcaster, and now over at Chicago State University doing a lot of the same stuff. I'm really passionate about storytelling you know i i used to say i'm a sports nut who just loves to talk but that's it's really much more than that like i love the stories that go into sports and i love the people in sports and through my broadcasting that's kind of parlayed into me really discovering this love of studying the mind right studying mental health in sports i think it's really important i've gone through my own mental health issues and I think sports psychology is fascinating, which is why I started the Mental Game podcast. It's been really an excuse for me to learn from cool people. I had you on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, Jonathan, and I've got to talk to some really awesome psychologists, athletes, coaches about what goes into their minds when they're performing. And as a media guy who's broadcasting games, writing about games, that informs me so much because it's so much more than the X's and O's. You know, when you see a player go into a slump and you say, oh, what the hell is going on with that guy? Well, there's a lot more that goes into it than just the actual execution of his game, especially when we talk college sports. There's so much happening. They're learning. They're growing. I mean, the brain isn't fully developed yet. So this is all to say that I'm really passionate about the mental side of the game. Uh, but what I love doing most is play-by-play -play broadcasting. I love being on the front lines, and I'm glad I get to do a lot of it here in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I couldn't think of a better city. When, when we just think about 
history and just being so rich, especially from a sports perspective, because I mean, you, you like you said so much and there's so many things I want to circle back to um, just what you said. But when we think about Chicago, we have the Cubs and, and, and we have Kerry Wood and we have Sammy Sosa. And then we, then we have the, Those are the guys I grew up with, baby. Oh my goodness. There, there it's, it's just, it's just so rich. So first, what is it like being in that culture day to day, like in just in the thick of just a, such a sports rich, just such a sports rich culture with you being in the position that you're in? Like, what 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 is that like? It's something that I think I too often take for granted. And that's because I was born here. That's because I would go to Wrigley Field and watch Sammy Sosa, who you nailed. He was my favorite player growing up because Sam, Sam, Sammy Sosa. Um, I took it for granted, though. And now I don't because now I realize that Chicago's unique. You know, not every nook and cranny of the world is like Chicago. This is an awesome sports city where we have so much college, high school, pro, and the events I've been able to go to, that's really what I feel lucky about. I, I got to work as a production assistant for MLB Network during the World Series in 2016. I mean, I was running around. I was buying groceries for the, for the talent truck and, you know, putting out medication and snacks for, uh, you know, for the MLB Network uh, studio talent. But I got to be at the World Series. It was the most amazing week of my life. And if you're not in a city like Chicago, maybe you don't get those opportunities. I mean, look, the Cubs, you, you know, you wouldn't have that opportunity for 108 years until I did. So I definitely struck the timing well. But it, it's cool to be in that culture. I think Chicagoans have an edge about them. And I love being on the front lines right here in Chicago. And now I'm able to work in Chicago sports. Man, yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about the storytelling aspect that that goes into what you do. Because you said earlier, like you're really big on storytelling. And I think storytelling is one of the things that continues to come to the forefront now, or at least there's more so a highlight on storytelling now, like, like never before. But just talk, talk a little bit about a little bit about that, Sam. Oh, yeah. Story, it's all storytelling. I mean, sports is a story. You know, when let's say the White Sox are playing the Red Sox and the score is four to two Boston in the fourth inning. And then the White Sox come back and win. That's a story. Everything's a story and every person has a story. And part of what I love about doing a baseball game, for example, as a broadcaster is let's say Jonathan Jones steps up to the plate. I'm my style at least is I'm not just going to say here's Jonathan Jones at the plate. He's one for two today, and he has a 350 batting average of four home runs this season. That's like boring, right? I mean, that's just numbers. I want to say, Jonathan Jones, like, what's his deal? Where's he from? What did he do in high school? Uh, what are some of his favorite, you know, memories? Maybe I probably will take the effort to go talk to Jonathan before the game and learn a thing or two about him. Maybe find a cool story from his high school newspaper about him that has some interesting nuggets. What did Jonathan's parents do? Uh, what's his upbringing like? How did he get involved uh, with the sport of baseball? Like how old was he when he first picked up a bat? Like all those things are stories. And I love weaving that into sports. And as a broadcaster, it just gives me a chance to humanize the game. So when you're watching a game on TV, it's not just pitch, hit, pitch ball pitch strike i mean i love baseball if it was just that it would still be fun but it's more fun when you really know who the people are what they've overcome and what they're all about yeah yeah so ha have, have you always taken that approach or was this like did, did you end up picking up this approach from from some people you work with and some of the other places that that, that you've worked because i know we didn't even dive deep into that but you know go, go please go like go ahead and uh, sh shine a little light on that and talk a little bit more about that just what's your philosophy Oh, absolutely. I mean, I part of being in Chicago is I've got to listen to some awesome broadcasters. So more recently here with the White Sox, I'm thinking about Jason Benetti, play-by-play -play announcer for the White Sox, is spectacular at this. Len Casper, Pat Hughes, Chuck Swirsky, Neil Funk. I mean, we have some of the best professional broadcasters in the country, in the world, are right here in Chicago. And a lot of those 
gentlemen that I mentioned are really good at telling those stories. And it's a skill that I've tried to craft because there's a way to tell a story. I don't want to, if you come to the plate, Jonathan, just spill out your life story before the first pitch. I mean, that's like a sloppy way. I'm not just going to give a bullet point. Jonathan was born here, went to high school here. Blah, 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 here's the pitch, <laughs> right? I've got to be creative. Let me tell you something about Jonathan. Here's a super, you know, microscopic part of his life um, that I'm going to tell you about. And thus the viewer can sit back and watch and be like, okay, I understand something about Jonathan. And it, it's a, it's a story about people. He's not just a blank face hoisting the bat over his right shoulder. He actually is, is a person with a story. So I've got to learn from some of those people I mentioned, and um, I've been grateful to work with athletes and coaches in my very young career so far who have been open to telling me about their stories. Like I'll give you a good one. Butch Hobson is the manager of the Chicago dogs, the professional baseball team I work for. He played for the Red Sox back in the seventies. He managed the Red Sox in the nineties. He's just an encyclopedia. I mean, the guy's been in professional baseball for as long as my parents have been alive. And Butch probably won't be happy to hear that because I'm making him sound really old, but <laughs> he, uh, he, he's been around the block and he's just got amazing stories. Like he'll sit me down. He told me about how he used to be the backup quarterback actually on the Alabama football team when, you know, who was coach bear Bryant. Wow. So this guy who played in the majors also played for bear Bryant at Alabama. And Butch was telling me, very intimately about the story of when he had to go into Bear Bryant's office and tell him, hey, I don't think I'm going to play football anymore because I want to go into professional baseball. Turned out to be a good decision. He had a seven-year career. Mm. But that's a tough thing to tell Bear freaking Bryant, who was like the king of Alabama at the time. So stories like that that I'll then tell on air just make a broadcast so much more enjoyable. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I was leaning in. I was listening. I'm like, wait, what? Wait, what? So he was a two sport guy and he played for the Bear Bryant? The Bear Bryant, not the other one. <laughs> not where the other one is. <laughs> oh Although I think God. there are actually a lot of Bear Bryants in Alabama because I think a lot of people named their kids Bear Bryant. There was like a big spike in that after, uh, uh, okay. you know, after they won all those gajillion national championships. Hmm. Okay. So with all the places that you've had the privilege to work and uh, j just the different, I guess, roles that you've held, where, where would you say, I'm not gonna say your favorite, but where, where would you say is a place that's left a mark on you just in regards to being like really memorable and it stuck out for this thing or this experience? Well, I'll tell you the last, my, my first year working with the Chicago Dogs when I was fresh out of college, I literally graduated in the middle of the season and was on the road doing a hundred games, crisscrossing the Midwest with a bunch of guys who were in their thirties who had, you know, a lot of them were married with kids. Some of them had played in the majors. I just mentioned my coach had played in the majors and managed there. And I had to grow. That really was a, a huge developmental experience for me because I went in a little nervous. I was thinking, okay, I'm this little pipsqueak fresh out of college and all these guys are like big and strong and older and they've been around the block and I was nervous about how I'd be treated. Mm -hmm. But I learned a lot about relationships and to this day, a lot of the players from that team and coaches from that team are good friends of mine that I keep in regular contact with because we're on the road together, we're in the trenches together on 10, 20 hour bus rides sometimes in the middle of the night from Kansas City to Chicago or from Winnipeg to Milwaukee. And you're in the trenches with people and you learn a lot about people and you learn about a lot about how to relate to people, how to get information out of people while being good friends, while being a nice guy and like a good human because the reality is when you're cooped up on a little bus like that in the middle of nowhere and 3 a.m., if you're not a good person who is enjoyable to be around, mm -hmm. 
it will bring out the worst in you and everyone. So I just learned a lot about relating to people in a, in a professional context and, and feel like that first year with the Chicago dogs really just taught me a lot about life in general. For some reason, as you were telling that story, I was just thinking, <laughs> I don't know why the correlation was in my head, but I was thinking of like rookie of the year. Well, I guess cause Chicago. He uh -huh, played, uh -huh. he played for the Cubs. Uh -huh. so he, even though there's an age difference for sure, and I'm not saying you all look alike at all, but I'm just saying, but he was the young guy with the traveling with these grown men, you know, competing in that way. So I just got the visual of like you, I guess, basically being rookie of the year. I, I was the rookie. And it's really funny that you mentioned rookie of the year. My dad is a rock star. When I was little, he was in two bands, actually. He, he, had to retire in 04, but he still has a bunch of guitars. I mean, I was just at his house in California. He's got like a wall of guitars. He plays every night. He's super talented. And I listen to his music still all the time. When I was in the womb, he wrote a song called mm -hmm. Rookie of the Year. And it's yeah. about me. And when I was eight days old, he got the whole family together and he performed it. And it's my favorite song. It's actually, if you listen to my wow. podcast, the Mental Game Podcast on Apple and Spotify, the intro and outro music is Rookie of the Year, which is a song about me. So wow. I'm glad you mentioned that that Rookie of the Year. <laughs> wow. I never, wow. That's pretty neat. Yes, Man. sir. Yeah. Man, that's super, that's super neat. That's super neat. Wow. Sam, you want to know? You want to know something else that's super neat? I, 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 I was doing a little bit of research, and I, I saw you have a you you have a you have a documentary out there about you. Yeah, you know, I was <laughs> I was grateful to have that made. Um, that was the folks over at HPTV Highland Park High School, where I went to high school. They made a documentary about me. They I they emailed me and asked me if I would participate. And I was like, why why me? <laughs> you, you, all these incredible things in the world. Um, no, that was a really cool experience. I was I was I was grateful to have them feature me. It's cool to watch and, and my family liked it. I know that. Yeah, it, 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 it was it was cool to watch. But just for the people who haven't seen it, yet, just, just talk a little bit about it, just to bring some context around the documentary, just, just so just so the people are, are, are aware out there of, of what we're discussing. So they don't feel like they're 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 left out there on an island. So help us out, Sam. Oh, if you're on an island, let me just reel you in, baby. It's uh yeah. So the documentary, you know, focuses on my path since it since it came from the high school TV station, it focuses on my path from there to the professional ranks um, and a lot of the interviews take place at my press box in the broadcast booth over at impact field where the chicago dogs play and a lot of what i talk about in the documentary was the role of my high school tv station in getting me into the media industry which was pretty much me as a you know little gangly sophomore wearing like baggy basketball shorts and a neon green shirt. I'll never forget this shirt I was wearing on this day. I walked in and said, Hey, I'm Sam. I want to do a sports show. And they were like, okay, you can do that. And I was like, all right, uh, let's do it. And I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, Mr. Vogel saying was my teacher, the director of the media center who just retired this year, he worked for decades. He's wonderful. He took me under his wing and he taught me how to do it. And I used to just sit up there like this. I'd be like, the basketball team won 61-58. The baseball team lost three to two. The tennis team won. Thank you. I'm Sam Brief. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was like the show. And then by senior year, I ended up being more polished. I would have guests. I would go out to games and, and cover them. And then uh, I got into the play-by-play. -play. So the documentary really focuses on my path from that, the guy in the neon shirt, to the person I am today. Wow. Wow. So what is it, what does it take to become a successful broadcaster, Sam? Well, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad to be successful where, where I am now, but believe me, I, I still believe I have a long way to go. Um, but what it takes, and I need to continue to tap into this is it takes resilience and it takes the ability to adapt and be flexible. 
Um, mm-hmm. This last year taught me that more than anything. I mean, when our season was canceled, that was the ultimate be flexible, right? And then when the season came back, that was a be flexible moment. Um, but it really takes resilience. I mean, I've had to grind in in this, you know, working in minor league baseball. Um, and I say minor league baseball. We're not in a minor league baseball. It's an independent league, but it's, it's in the realm of minor league baseball. Uh, you have to be willing to call a game, go on a bus at midnight, take it to, let's say, Winnipeg, get there at 10 a.m., take a nap, go to the ballpark, and call another game. And you have to learn how to do that, which takes physical skill. And I say skill really not in like having any innate trait that makes me able to do that, but in learning your body and learning how much water you need to drink, how much food you need to eat, how much sleep you need to try to get. (laughs) Um, But it takes that. It just takes some, some mental resilience. And that's where studying sports psychology has helped me because even though broadcasting is not a sport, It is a performance and I have to be locked in. So I would say the three things it takes, I already mentioned the resilience and the flexibility, but also focus. Um, And there's my fingers focus. Number three. I mean, when I'm on air, if I'm distracted, man, you can tell, at least I can tell. uh, I would struggle with that. My first year, hundred games in a season. How do you stay focused for a hundred games, three hours at a time? I struggled with that. Um, And it's a skill that you have to hone and practice that when the game's in front of you, nothing else matters. Any issues you have going on at home, what you're having for dinner after the game, how you have a headache, that doesn't matter. The game matters. And that kind of laser focus is, is what the best athletes have. And I think the best broadcasters and really the best people in any field, like corporate leaders, professors, like they have that that focus, that laser focus. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, cause just like I've told you offline, Sam, mm-hmm. like you, you have a, you have a phenomenal voice. You, you have, you have, you have a, you have a voice for this space. And like I told you, I said, I can see you, you know, I can see you turn after I turn on TV and hear you like calling a game or something like that. Like I, I can see it because your voice I'm like, wow. I can tell that you've done something. So like what, like what have you invested into training your voice? Thank you, Jonathan. Th- that means a lot. And it means a lot that you say it because I've worked at it. I've invested a lot of time and effort into training my voice. Not with a formal instructor. I haven't done voice lessons. And it really takes a commitment. I wasn't born with the booming baritone radio voice. Like I got a buddy who I've broadcasted a lot with who was born with that. I mean, you talk to this guy and you're like, whoa, Mr. Like born to be on the radio. (laughs) I don't have that like booming announcer voice. And I have to embrace that. Actually, when I was in college, when I listen back to my stuff, I hear myself trying to do that. I hear myself going, and welcome in. This is Northwestern Baseball. I'm Sam Brief. Like, that's not, I don't sound like me. I sound like an idiot doing that. So uh, the key for me is to be real but authoritative. I need to make my voice, I don't need to make my voice this low fake thing. I just need to be authoritative. And it means a lot to hear someone like you recognize uh, that effort because, frankly, it's how I talk in my day to day life. Like, Mm. I'm not the type of guy who you'll hear on air and be like, whoa, what's that? Where did that voice come from? Like, it's my voice. And uh, really what I do to practice is I call games all the time on my computer, on my phone. Like every day I make sure to call at least a snippet of a game, even when I don't have a game. So like today, for example, I have no game to be on air for, but about a half hour before I joined you, I pulled up an old game on my computer and I just took out my phone and recorded me calling it. And I listened back to it and I heard some things I liked and I heard some things I didn't like. And I wrote down some notes and I moved on uh, because it's a muscle to flex. And I think when you do it enough, the muscle grows and becomes something to be proud of. Wow. 
Wow, Sam, you you really you really just said a lot there. So one one thing I just one one thing I took away from what you just said was just the education aspect. Mm-hmm. And and although like you said you didn't have a formal instructor, but I I want I want a lot of people to make sure they understand just the aspect of now more than ever before there are multiple ways to skin a chicken, I guess, as as the old folks would say, right? There there's multiple ways to to get trained. There's multiple ways to educate yourself. So you you taking that route, and then the other aspect I really like what you what you shared, which is talking about how you initially were attempting to sound like somebody else, and then you came into your own voice and you came into your own lane. And then the third thing I'm I'm just gonna add on there, I really like that you said this that you said you take the time and you self assess. You you so so basically you're you know you're an individual who's going to the batting cage and you're getting in extra cuts right you're getting in extra cuts mm-hmm. nobody's mm-hmm. watching you're checking your form and you're checking how you sound yep. just like you said you're making the notes and I, and I think that's i think all of what you shared is so applicable to life in so many different ways but i just, I just wanted to make sure to highlight those points because you said you said some really good stuff sam you're cooking really good over there oh i can cook man <laughs> i can do that too no I, you know i appreciate you bringing those out and i know you work with a lot of student athletes uh, and it's something that I, something I've learned, and I think this will be helpful too for the people that you, that you talk to a lot and work with. It's if if you want to learn how to do something or learn about something, you can. Uh, for example, like with with psychology and and this podcast I do, sports psych. I didn't major in psych or minor in psych in college part of me sort of wishes i did because since college i've gotten really into it and i would love to take some of these classes but i've given myself the education by checking out books at the library and just reading it because i'm interested in it i mean i'm not checking out like you know boring 700 page page psych manuals and textbooks like (laughs) they're interesting books um but i'm sort of giving myself the education and the same with the broadcasting now I'd be remiss if I didn't say I have mentors in broadcasting. You know, I've got people in my corner who are above me on the totem pole who take the time to listen to my stuff and say, hey, Sam, this is good. This is not well, – maybe work on this. You know, and that's helpful. It's almost like a, having a professor in the field who's an informal mentor. Um, so I am lucky to have that. But, but I think the point you bring out about accessible education – is um is is a really valuable one i know for your audience Cer- certainly certainly and then sam wh- where did the concept come from for the mental game podcast because uh i mean understanding that like we were talking about before about uh if it's if it's being mentally tough enough to call a game late hop on the bus get on the get off the bus after a a brief siesta or a brief nap if you will literally a brief nap in my <laughs> that's so funny that's so funny i see what you did there i see what you did there but how, how, where, where did this come from for for the mental game podcast and and why why are you so driven and why are you so just focused on on the mental aspect of the game of life yeah yeah so the mental game of life i'll start with it's that i went through my own mental health journey I had to confront my own anxiety and start going to therapy and start prioritizing that in my life. So me having my own journey with that while I'm working in sports every day inspired me to fuse the two together. Now, the real day of inspiration was this summer, like last summer, 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, when I was working for the Chicago Dogs. It was before a game. We did play this year. We had a shortened season with very few fans and testing, and it was all, you know, kind of a weird, bubbly one of those deals. And it was mentally taxing on a lot of the players. And there was one player in particular who, at the time, his wife was pregnant and he had two young kids at home. And he was very nervous about COVID and bringing it back by going to a crowded ballpark and then coming back home to his family. And I could see that was taking a mental strain on him. And I had some really good conversations with him, with our manager, with, with players, like real conversations about what playing during the pandemic was doing for them. 
And I just really enjoyed these conversations. They were so much more fulfilling to me than, so tell me about your curveball. What have you been working on? Oh, what'd you do last night? And that, what'd you see on that home run? Like that, that you need to do that sometimes, but having these real conversations really got me going. And while going through my own mental health journey, uh, I just got inspired to start this podcast. I call it my passion project because no one's forcing me to do it, right? It, it, it's something that I truly enjoy doing in part because it gives me an excuse to talk to cool people. I get to have real conversations with athletes, with coaches, with licensed psychologists, with people like you, who was my last guest on the podcast. And I get to have these, I get to create something, and I get to spread the word about mental health in sports, but mental health in the world and erasing the stigma. That's something I'm passionate about. And if this podcast can simultaneously give me something to do that I enjoy, but also help other people be open about their mental health, because that's something I talk to a lot of the athletes about and share myself personally, is that it's okay to talk. And it's actually better to talk. I would love to have this podcast help erase the stigma of mental health. And um, if it does a little bit, if it can chip in the wood a little bit, then I think I'm doing a good job. Yeah, I think it's a phenomenal resource. And even, I mean, j just with your your passion behind it, because, you know, you you have some skin in the game. So understanding that, you know, you have a personal tie and then even <clears throat> the aspect of, you know, you connecting with with players, with coaches, you know, psychologists, counselors, therapists all down the line. So I, th I think that's really I think that's really amazing. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's definitely amazing. And thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. And I'm, I'm gonna take a take a slight pivot, and I'm 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 curious just to hear from you if there were if you had the opportunity to sit down at the table. You sit down at the table, and I'm gonna say you have dinner, not lunch, because lunch is typically quicker. But you could have dinner with, you can name one to three people Ooh. you would want to sit down at the table and have dinner with, alive or dead or wherever. Who would these people be? Oh. Okay, I get one to three people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. alive or dead. Okay. Yeah, now, give me a sack here. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. I'm going to go. I'm certainly going to choose all three. I, okay. see, I see the value in having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but if I can go anyone in the world, like... I could have three one-on-one. -on -one. I could be like, all right, you sit to the side. You know, I'm going to have a conversation <laughs> here. Like, I'm going to take advantage of all three. That feels like a genie giving you three wishes and being like, nah, one's fine. Uh, so I'll go with three. I'm going to say I would like to speak with Alexander Hamilton, Michael Jordan, and Barack Obama. Why? You got to give me some context on those three. I know the Hamilton one raised your eyebrows and a huge reason why is because I I'm like super into Hamilton right now. The musical I okay. watched it on Disney plus and have, I watched it in July and I think I've logged like probably 300 hours listening and jamming out to the soundtrack since. And oh. then I got obsessed with it and read the whole book. It's an 800 page biography that oh, the thing wow. is based off of. And I'm just super fascinated by him. I mean, the guy was an immigrant from St. Croix, which is now like uh, pretty much the old Dutch Indies uh, in the Caribbean. He was an immigrant to America and built everything. I mean, he built the whole financial system, the Coast Guard. Like, hmm. I mean, he founded a lot and was a really interesting dude. He worked in the trenches, obviously, with like George Washington and all these guys. And I'm an American history nut. And I would just love to talk to him. I mean, he's also like kind of a crazy dude. So I'm into that. Uh, Michael Jordan. I, I mean, I got to talk to Michael Jordan, right? I'm a Chicago guy. I need to like hear the dirt on the 90s bulls. And also he's a super successful media and business mogul. And I think I could learn a thing or two from Michael Jordan, no doubt, who's built you know, a media empire. Um, and then... Barack Obama, another Chicago connection. I mean, how could I not speak to 
the, the, the amount of things I could cover with Barack Obama would be, you know, just just from his presidency to his rise to being the first African-American president ever to, you know, I mean, the guy's a Chicago sports fan. He's a White Sox fan, just like me. So uh, we could just, you, you know, shoot the crap on the White Sox in Chicago mm -hmm. and <laughs> talk about that. So uh, I think that'd be a pretty lively conversation. And I do think there'd be some synergy. Certainly Hamilton would feel like the odd man out. Uh, I think Jordan and Obama, they, I think they've met before. I'm almost positive. I've seen interviews with them before. So there would be synergy there. Hamilton, I might have to creatively bring into the fold. <laughs> so that's my dinner. It's a funky one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that'd be a great dinner party. I'm sure that'd be a great one. Yeah. You could come next time if I get four. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's good to know. That's good. I might sneak into that one though. Yeah. I might sneak into that one. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a, li a lighter question before okay. we get into the two minute drill, but why is it, or how do you decide between being a White Sox fan and being a Cubs fan? How does that, how does that go? Okay. This is actually a story. And you mentioned Sammy Sosa already. So I grew up a Cubs fan when I was very young, like, from ages zero to maybe five or six, I was a Cubs fan. I would go to Wrigley Field in my Cubs hat, Cubs jersey, but I wasn't really a Cubs fan. I was just a Sammy Sosa fan, obsessed with Sammy Sosa. I mean, everything I owned was Sammy Sosa, jerseys, shirts, bobbleheads, baseball cards, like all Sammy Sosa all the time because he had my name. So he had to be my idol, right? And then the Cubs traded him. I'll never forget, I was sitting at the kitchen table eating a bowl of Cocoa Crisp, which, not the healthiest breakfast, but my dad allowed me to eat it. He came down, he put the Chicago Tribune in front of my face, and he said, look, the Cubs traded Sammy Sosa to Baltimore. And I said, okay, I guess I'm an Orioles fan now. And for a year, I was a Baltimore Orioles fan. Oh, wow. I bought Orioles stuff, I had an Orioles hat. My dad, for my birthday, which is in July, actually took me to Baltimore and we oh, went wow. to an Orioles Rangers game that Sammy Sosa hit a freaking home run in best day ever. Right. So I'm wow. an Orioles fan. And then I go through that season by now I'm getting older. I think I was like eight crystallizing into a more mature young man, not really a man, young boy. And I looked at the end of that season and I just sort of looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, dude, you're a little kid growing up in Chicago. You can't be a, Baltimore Orioles fan like you can't that's just not how it's done I felt icky about that but I couldn't be a Cubs fan because the Cubs traded Sammy Sosa how could I have been a Cubs fan so I said all right I'll become a White Sox fan and now I'm a White Sox fan so it's a little unconventional but that's my my story to White Sox fandom and now at this point in my life being a you know working in in pro sports you know I like the Cubs I went to a Cubs game the other day I root for them, but definitely my loyalties are with the Sox. Understood. Understood. Man. Bet you didn't expect that. I, I didn't. I mean, that, that's a good story, though. I can appreciate the story. And that's pretty cool that he hit a home run yes. on, your, on, on the time you went out there for your birthday. That would be so memorable. There was some juju in the air. I believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it. I believe it. So now we're going we're gonna to transition to the two-minute drill, Sam. Mm-hmm. And for anybody who this might be their first time watching or listening, the two minute drill is ultimately where I'm going to just throw some rapid fire questions at Sam here. And then we're going to have a little bit of fun. So, Sam, are you ready? Born ready. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Favorite food. Steak. How you like it cooked? Medium rare. Oh, nice. 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 OK. What's the last book you read? Um, Chuck Klosterman's What If We're Wrong. Hmm. Okay, okay. What's Make your... me think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. What's your go-to streaming show of preference? Seinfeld. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's so many seasons. Oh, yeah. So many episodes. <laughs> uh, what's your... What, what, what's your favorite podcast? Favorite podcast is How I Built This by Guy Raz. That is a solid one. That's a really solid one. That's a really solid one. And then last but not least, what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? 
I would say keep the big picture in mind. Keep the type of person you want to be in mind. Don't be afraid to prioritize your true interests. Don't be afraid to prioritize your family, yourself, your mental health. Um, but just keep that bigger picture in mind as you go through the daily grind of work and school and practice and everything. Just just keep in the back of your mind the type of person that you would like to be and make sure you're always advancing the needle towards that. That's rich, Sam. That's rich. And then the bonus question, who's one guest that you'd like to see me interview on Beyond the Ball next? I would like to see... Ooh, you know who I'd really like to see? Who's it? Is, is Pat Fitzgerald, Northwestern head football coach, okay. who I think has done as good of a job as any coach in recent memory in the country at building a culture. Mm -hmm. And I'd be fascinated, even if it's not Fitz, if it's someone in that program who's been around, to learn a bit more about the culture, because I know that's something that you're interested in. And how do you build winning culture out of what for so many years was a losing culture northwestern fans used to root for the team to lose because they wanted to set the record for most losses in a row that's how bad the losing culture oh, wow. was and suddenly he turned it into a team that was going to big 10 championship games consistently so uh, mm -hmm. i'd be very interested to hear Fitz or anyone in that program on the subject of culture on beyond the ball with jj oh man wow Wow. Well, Sam, go, go ahead. Let, let the people know where they can follow you, how they can find you and connect with you at this time, please. Absolutely. I am at Twitter, uh, at Sam Brief, B-R-I-E-F. You got it right there, twitter.com slash Sam Brief. Search me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can subscribe to the Mental Game Podcast, Apple and Spotify. Just search Mental Game Sam Brief, and you can subscribe. I've got an exciting lineup of guests coming up. The guy who I'm talking to right now was my last guest. So if you want to hear the tables turned a little bit, you can listen to Jonathan on the mental game, but subscribe right there. And then you can catch my work live Chicago state university, all home and road athletic events broadcast live. I uh, just go to go CSU cougars.com. That's uh, my primary role. And then also the Chicago dogs baseball team, the Chicago dogs.com. We start the season on May 18th, my third year with the team. And Jonathan, I'm fired up. I love it, man. I love it, as you should be, as you should be. Well, Sam, I'm, 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 I'm excited to, to have the opportunity for, you know, to have you as a guest and turn the tables on, on you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to continue to, to follow your journey, stay connected and be able to look up one day and then, you know, see your name up there calling calling the game calling the shots man so thank you for taking the time and and hopping on and thank you for adding value to the to all the ballers out there i appreciate it jonathan I'm, I'm a lifelong fan of yours and i know our paths have already crossed a few times in the last year and i know the path crossings will be many to come and i'm, I'm really looking forward to that so thanks for having me on this was a lot of fun likewise likewise my friend everybody out there all the ballers out there i would encourage you all to definitely connect with Sam because he's 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 a great person. I mean, in addition to being a being a phenomenal sports broadcaster, but just like I said, a, a great person, uh, even more so than that. So I'd encourage you all to connect with him and screenshot the episode wherever you're listening to, and then shoot him a DM, tag him, tag me, and uh, let him know and let me know as well what you got out of the episode, what you really enjoyed about the episode, and then also I'd encourage you. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube because we're putting up all our episodes on YouTube and also some exclusive content. So subscribe on YouTube as well. I'm Jonathan Jones. This is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.